usually uh, eating a, a big lunch like that is not conducive to the arising of words of wisdom. <laughs> necessarily for uh, listening to them, but anyway, we'll give it our best shot. So I've been here at uh, Santi Monastery for nearly 10 years now. Uh, some of you uh, I have known since uh, almost the first time I've been here. Uh, Nalini has been here since the big paddy. of a monastery like this is almost 
um, living proof of that that a better way is possible. It's it's a real thing. It's not just. I think this is one of the most important things that a monastery can offer. We get very cynical about humanity and about what what people are and what they do and so on. I read in the paper this morning that the uh, the new study shows that the the super rich in the world have. Uh, spirited away thirteen trillion dollars is the latest estimate. Thirteen trillion dollars. That's been shifted out, out, out into tax havens and the like by the by the super rich. That's a lot of money. Thirteen trillion. And in the face of such overwhelming greed, with the existence of a place like this very humble. In a way, it's nothing special. It's just a few buildings in a, in a, in a, on a piece of bush. But it is also very, very special. And of course, any uh, acknowledgement, I mean, I can't I even hope to acknowledge all of the people who have uh, given and con uh, offered during the period, but you can't go without mentioning, of course, the uh, greatest donor of them all is uh, Elizabeth Gorski, who uh, gave us the land and the, the basis of the buildings that we're living on. Uh, and our, our sister Neroda, Bikuni Neroda, she'd probably be mortified. <laughs> uh, she's very humble. Um, uh, but uh, she supported this place, and not just this place, but many other places as well. So the Ataram Monastery also donated by her, and also many other places around the Sydney region were supported by her while she was around. So that's how much difference one person can make. <coughs> when I came here, so when I came here, uh, Nearly, nearly ten years ago, I came in about I think it was March, two thousand and three, March or April two thousand and three. Uh, <coughs> there was there was very little uh, happening here. There was one monk at the time, one uh, caretaker, and then uh, Danny, um, and the other monk who was here, Ajahn Kemenando, left before that rains, and so I, there was talk of uh, closing the. Um, Closing the place down in that range retreat in 2003. It was felt that there wasn't anybody to um, bring down uh, Nobody was bringing down at all at that time. There was no support. And the proposal was that the place be shut down and you know, closed up for that period. Well, so I just said, <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to stay here anyway. And if there's not anybody here, well, I'll go hungry. But I'll just stay here and I'll have faith that things will come together. That's all. I had no idea how they would come together. I had no idea how we'd do anything. But I was just saying, okay, we'll just stay. I'll just stay. And of course, things worked out okay. We had one uh, layman, Valdic, came for that rains retreat and uh, he did the cooking and so on for that rains and so we had a nice time together. And that was the beginning of. Uh, the beginning of what we've done here. So I look back over the years and um, <coughs> many remarkable things that we've done. As you can see, the, probably the most remarkable, most important thing is to build a community uh, that you're all part of. To give people a chance to experience the way of practice of the forest tradition, to um, support the monastics who come to live here, and uh, especially to those who have decided to ordain here. Uh, and uh, in the room now we have how many on Bhattacharya, and Nandia, and Prasada, who have all uh, taken ordination here. And uh, since I can't remember which year we started, probably the first ordination we did was maybe 2005 or 2006.
And since then we've done all nations each year. And uh, we've been the only place in the Sydney region where, where people who wanted to ordain as monks and nuns uh, and to study and practice in English uh, have been able to. So that, I think, is an extremely valuable service. And, of course, the one of the main things that we've done, as well as all those things, is to support the Bikuni community. And uh, this has been something that's been of great personal importance to me. When I was, um, when I was at Bodhmiana in in WA in about 1998 it would have been uh, I remember having a conversation with my sister and um, my sister is a very uh, good person unlike me um, <laughs> she is very together organised um, but basically if you look at all of those things that I'm not then she is those things uh, And she's not a particularly either pro or, or anti-spiritual person. Yeah? She's, she's, more inter she's very interested in social justice issues and things like that. But she said one time when we were talking, she said very kind of gently and not, not, in, a very, not in a negative or critical way at all, but she just said that she, she'd found that she <coughs> couldn't really... Uh, she found it difficult to commit or become really uh, invested in any uh, any religion um, because none of them gave women a fair go. And that kind of really struck me when, when she said that. Huh? And you know, I began to wonder what, what kind of religion is this if, if my sister can't get a fair go? Because she's actually an okay person. So maybe the rest, or every other woman in the world might not be. Maybe every other woman in the world is completely messed up, but my sister is okay. I know that. I can't vouch for everybody else. And there's something wrong there. And I knew that there was something wrong, but I didn't know what could be done about it. Um, at that time, of course, in, in Bodhnyana, we were supporting the establishment of Dhammasara Nuns Monastery. Uh, and that actually happened during the period I was there. I mean, I don't claim any, um, any credit for it. It was done by the Buddhist Society together with Ajahn Brahm. But that was in that period, and so we were becoming aware of some of these issues. And that was the time we invited Ajahn Wayama to go over there and, and found, the, uh, found that uh, Nuns Monastery. So uh, subsequent to that, I spent some time in Malaysia, some time in Thailand, and actually my time, especially my time in Malaysia, was also very formative for me, because uh, I got to get to know quite a lot of monks from uh, outside of my own tradition. I was a day in the Ajahn Chah tradition, and up to then I'd only really known monks from within that tradition. So I got to meet monks from outside that tradition, and I got to meet uh, nuns, and I got to meet people from got to know much better people from Mahayana backgrounds and other Buddhist traditions. And as I did that, I began to see and to, to, to understand better uh, the, 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 the common or the shared or the core elements between all of these things, the things that, that united the Buddhists <coughs> from different backgrounds and different traditions. And I could see that even though, yes, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the people who know me, I'm a, I'm a scholar, I'm a, I'm a, I have a very strong critical mind, I do text critical studies and I analyse all the differences between texts and all of these kinds of things. So I'm not somebody who sweeps differences under the carpet and tries to ignore them. But at the same time, I'm also aware that if you look at those things that really matter, then there is so much that's held in common among all these different traditions. And I, or the other thing that I noticed my time when I spent, spent more than a year in Ipo, at the Sukhavana cave in Ipo, and uh, if there's anybody from Ipo who's 
here. Oh, we've got at least one EPO person here. Yeah. Uh, anyone else from EPO? Shout out to all EPO people here. <laughs> okay, so anyone EPOist? Uh, my time in EPO, I uh, one of the other things that was very obvious was that uh, almost most of the people who came to the monastery were women, and uh, and that included basically all of the the uh, meditators. The blokes used to come and like to hang around and chat and do work and stuff like that and argue about dharma. But when it came to meditation time, the uh, the really serious practitioners were all women, and some of them very serious. And one of the families who used to support me uh, every day bringing dana, uh, 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 one of the sisters in that family is now Sister Hasapanya, in, also in Damasara Monastery. And so I knew her very well from Ipo, and that was the time that she decided she want to, wanted to uh, become a nun. And she did, I remember the day that she came and told me that she wanted to become a nun. Uh, a couple of days earlier, we'd been talking, and and I'd referred to, and I think probably read, the uh, suttas that King Ashoka had recommended for the sangha to study. So, in Buddhist history, the earliest um, sort of uh, concrete record of the names of Buddhist scriptures are found in some of the pillars of King Ashoka. It's about 250 BC. And one of the texts which King Ashoka mentions as his like curriculum for recommended study for the Sangha is the suttas on the, the called the Anagata Bhayani Sutra, or the suttas on the fears of the future. And essentially these suttas basically what they say is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we better do it now. So she, when she heard that, she felt very stirred and felt that she wanted to practice uh, as a nun and then embarked on that course. Eventually, she's now one of the co-abbots at Dhammasara Nun, nun Monastery. <coughs> so as I began to look into these these two things, really, one thing was the what is the what is the core? What is the shared basis of the Buddhist tradition? Those things that's really valuable about the Buddhist tradition, and also at that obviously it was a very pressing need to find a um, uh, a valid and supportive and authentic way for women to practice within Buddhism, especially within the forest tradition. And kind of the outcome of those two considerations, obviously, was what led to my support for the Bikuni ordination um, earlier. Uh, myself, like uh, Ajahn Brahm and others, had been convinced by this idea that you know it's better to just have ten precept nuns and it won't cause so much trouble and so on. And uh, anyway, I gave up that heresy and uh, eventually managed to uh, make Ajahn Brahm see the light as well. Uh, I wouldn't claim, wouldn't claim to ever uh, have the capacity to make Ajahn Brahm change his mind about anything, uh, but certainly uh, a lot of the work and advocacy and so on that I was doing was influential there. So to me this has been a very fascinating journey on, on many levels, and it be, it's become clear to me, and again this was something that first occurred to me when I was in EPO, uh, and I, I remember this, uh, uh, this, this thinking that, well look, if, if, if you're going to take this seriously about supporting the nuns and so on, that, that there's going to be, have to be some there's going to be something concrete to it. It's not just it's not just an idea. You're going to have to do something about it. Uh, actually, even in those days, and this was like 2000, and 2000 uh, I was planning as I was going to leave that place because my visa was running out. I was planning, wanted to recommend to the committee that they uh, see if they could find some nuns to run the place and have it as a nuns monastery because it would have been an ideal place for a nuns monastery. Uh, unfortunately, there were some problems in the committee at the time, which were later sorted out, but at that time there were some problems, uh, and uh, that wasn't able to happen. So, so this is really, really important, that there has to be some, there has to be a, an actual basis to this. If we want to, if we want to support, within Buddhism, if we want to support women's spirituality, the ability for women to practice and develop 
without feeling that they're being discriminated against and all of those things, then that has to be done within the frameworks which is offered <coughs> within the Buddhist tradition. Right? That's what the Buddhist tradition is. We can't just invent something out of whole cloth. We have to look what is our tradition and how do we live that, practice that authentically. And when we look at our tradition, then we see, of course, the Buddha established the Bhikkhuni Sangha. We don't have um, uh, um, the uh, we don't have like a, a lack of a, of, a, of a prototype or a role model. It's it's there. It's it's fully laid out and described for us. So then our problem, our our, our task has to be, our challenge has to be to to find a way to bring that and make that real. And that's what a monastery is. A monastery is a place where these these things are not just ideas anymore. In our <coughs> modern times, monasteries uh, have become much more complicated entities. In the old days, you'd walk through the forest and sort of set up a mosquito net and stay there and that's kind of okay, but you can't really do that anymore. We've got like property titles and insurance and OHS and uh, all of those contractors and all of those things which have to be uh, dealt with and so on. Uh, so to do that at Santi we have a committee uh, who's been doing a wonderful <coughs> job over the last 10 years. Uh, helping to support the Sangha by making all of those, uh, putting all those legal frameworks together. And a little bit later on, I'm going to be inviting Paddy to, as a representative of the committee to say a few words. So it's important to remember that all of these things have to be there. There's a, there's, it's, 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 it's a place like this just doesn't exist out of, out of nowhere. It exists because of the work of so many people. So people who, who know me will know that I'm not the sort of person who has kind of grand sort of plans or anything like that. I don't even have little plans. And <laughs> I say things as much as I can on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, which I realise can be a, uh, a source of great annoyance for people around me who have to try to do, do petty things like organise things. Uh, which I'm not very good at. So, you know, I, I, I have a, I've always had a kind of... I mean, a, a word vision is, is a very debased word these days, but I guess that's, that's how I operate more, is on a level of vision, of saying, well, where, where, where do we want to go and what do we want to achieve? Uh, and without having necessarily too much of a fixed idea of what the road is to get there. So as... In, in, in for myself, and what I've always tried to do is I try to, on the, on the one hand, to uh, live here as best as I can, to live here, practice my meditation, and do, do my uh, own study and practice as best I can. And Santi Monastery is really one of the best places in the world for that. For those of you who've, who've travelled around the Buddhist world and seen in, in, in uh, there are a lot of places to practice, uh, but often it's difficult with things like food and so on. Uh, Santi is extremely quiet, extremely beautiful. There's a very strong energy here. It's a little bit cold in the winter time, but that's about the only um, kind of major drawback here. In many ways, uh, we're very privileged, we're very lucky in terms of being able, uh, infrastructure, we get water from the town water supply, yeah? That's a huge deal. I was just at, at Jana Grove at, in WA and, you know, the, the amount of money that they spent on their water supply there is unbelievable, yeah? Pumps and filters and tanks and it costs huge amounts of money. We just turn on the tap, yeah? So in many ways, Santi has been uh, a very easy, physically a very easy place to live. And we've also been very lucky because uh, the community from Sydney, and I think most people here from Sydney, anyone from Canberra here today? Oh, a few people from Canberra, okay, of course. 
a few from Canberra. We've also had very good supporters from Canberra as well. Um, uh, but mo the bulk of our supporters have been from Sydney. Also Wollongong. Where's John? Oh, here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Wollongong. Excellent. Bathurst. Any Bathurst people? No, we've had supporters come from Bathurst and uh, uh, Wagga Wagga. Yeah. All around, people have come. But the community has been very wonderfully supportive and uh, uh, many people have come for many uh, reasons and I think everybody who comes gets something out of it. Uh, I think for many of us, <coughs> the obviously it's nice to go to a quiet and peaceful place. But hey, there's plenty of quiet and peaceful places that you can go to. Uh, there's something more to it and I think there's something to this idea. Uh, you know, when you see the uh, kutis, the caves, uh, so the kind of the lifestyle that we live here. Uh, there's something about the, the simplicity, the um, the authenticity of what we're doing here, which I think is very touching and very moving. Uh, and one thing which has been quite noteworthy is that we've always had a lot of uh, support from people from many different Buddhist uh, traditions, and not just the tradition of myself to trained in Thailand. Uh, so... Uh, we have people from the Thai community, like Rina and others, but also from, obviously, many from the Sri Lankan community and uh, Burmese and so on. We've also had a lot of support from the, the Vietnamese community, obviously, the uh, Western community and others, and also the different Buddhist traditions. Venerable uh, Yeshe is here visiting us again, one of our long-term friends. And we've had many supporters and, and friends here from the different uh, monastic traditions as well. And this is also something that I'm very proud of. Uh, something that I've seen in many forms of Buddhism and I think it's very unfortunate that people become very uh, insular, uh, that they only uh, associate with people from their own tradition. And so for me it's been very important to accept and to welcome people from all different traditions and backgrounds. Within this, that kind of diversity and the different things that we've done, the the um, the essence, or for me, the the core of what's important for me, has always been the two basic things that I keep keep coming back to. One is the experience of the Dhamma in meditation, and the second thing is the the study and the understanding of the suttas and the early Buddhist teachings, and so. These, these two things have been the, the basis for my Buddhist life right from the beginning. The very first thing that I did, well, I did, I did read one book. I read a book by Ajahn Buddha Dasa before I did a retreat. I didn't really understand much of it. <coughs> then I did a retreat. And so that was, that was it. After that retreat, I was a Buddhist. I knew that. And I knew I just wanted to practice but somehow. I didn't know how or what I was going to do, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. So meditation was always the beginning. And then after we came out of the retreat, it was a month long retreat, and I asked people, you know what, do you have any books I can read? And uh, they gave me one or two books, and I thought, oh yeah, that's all right. It's kind of boring, really. <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell you what books they were. <laughs> but I thought, oh yeah, that's it's kind of all right. But it's always, it was a bit kind of new agey, kind of wishy washy stuff. I don't know, people seem to like that stuff. But anyway, I thought it was a bit, I didn't like it very much. And I said, well, where's the real stuff? And then they said, oh, well, the Majjhima is over there. So I picked up the Majjhima Ah, that was it. I was gone. <laughs> and as soon as I, I started reading the Majjhima ah, this is what the Buddha taught. Yeah? It's not just someone's opinion. This is what the Buddha taught. And... It's very hard to explain these things. To me, it, it, there's, a, there's something about um, the, the suttas which has this kind of ring of authenticity to it. I can't explain it objectively. And in some ways, it's because it, I guess, because it chimed with my own experience in meditation. Those two things always seem to go together. I never had any problems with it. And when I listen to other teachers, I always, you know, oh, something is good and some things maybe have some questions or problems with. But when I read the suttas, it's Again and again and again, the, it's this, the, the, the splendor and the um, magnificence 
of the way that the Buddha presents the Dhamma, even from the smallest things through to the most profound teachings. And so this, these teachings of the Buddha in the uh, early suttas and also my own meditation practice, these have been the two guiding uh, principles for my own spiritual development in these last uh, nearly 20 years. And that's been the main focus of everything that I've done here at Sankhi. So now the time comes for me <coughs> to move on. And of course these two things will continue to be the most important things for me, I hope. They will remain also the most important things for the people here at Sankey. I hope that in the time that I've been here, I've been able to um, communicate those things and to encourage and support others to practice, to meditate, and to study and understand the Buddhist teachings a little bit better. And I hope that that will continue to be a guiding principle for the community and after I've left. Uh, for myself, most of you have probably read the announcement that I put on the, uh, the internet and uh, I uh, essentially I'm, I'm leaving for purely for my own personal reasons. And it's not, doesn't, my leaving doesn't really have anything to do with Santi as such. Uh, if it, to the extent that it does, which is only really a secondary thing, really, is my, I do feel that uh, it's time for, uh, to, if we want to establish a bhikkhuni community here very strongly, then that has to be done with the bhikkhunis leading the way, and it can't be done with me leading the way. So I've done what I can. Uh, but regardless of that, the main reason why I want to leave uh, is not really because of that, and it's not really because of Santi at all, it's just because I feel that it's something that I need to do. And I, I, I'm not very good at articulating it, and I think that when we make these big decisions, often we don't really understand them at the time, uh, and it's only much later that we'll actually understand what it means. Uh, and certainly, you know, if I look back in my life at the, you know, the time when I, I left uh, Sydney and went to Thailand to ordain, you know, at the time I didn't really have any idea what I was doing or why I was doing it. It's only when I reflect back now that I can understand it. Similarly, when I say left Thailand uh, and came to Australia, I had very vague notions of what I wanted and why I was doing that. Um, but it's only now as I look back I can see more clearly uh, what that was and why I was doing that. So even though I can't articulate it in a way that's very clear or very satisfactory, uh, I don't have any doubt myself that it's the right thing to do. If, if I was to try to articulate it more clearly, uh, uh, and I was <coughs> discussing this a little bit earlier with somebody, when I came here from Thailand, I had a, I had a, I had, it was because there was a shift for the first 10 years when I was practicing Dhamma, I was, I was very content just to be practicing, to be studying and meditating, and that was, that was exactly what was right for me. But gradually, at the end of that period, I had this kind of shift where I, I also wanted to be speaking, whether speaking literally or metaphorically, but I, I, felt, that, I felt that there were, there were things that I was doing or understanding or something which actually could be valuable and could be helpful. And specifically, I wanted to contribute and have a role where I could contribute within this culture, within an Australian culture. I didn't really know how that would happen, but I thought that there was something that I could bring that might that would be of use. And and it was and I felt not just that it would be of use for others, but also that in some way that it was answering to my own need, in my own spiritual development that I needed to take that role on. I mean that. I'm not sure what that sounds like to you, but that's just sort of try, trying to somehow articulate how I felt when I came from Thailand to Australia. And so in a similar sense now, I feel almost like that, that I've, I've said all those things that I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, if you look in the in the suttas, one of the things about the suttas is the Buddha kept on repeating himself all the time. <laughs> I really hate repeating myself. And uh, anyway, I'm sure I do it, but anyway, maybe the Buddha wouldn't have had to repeat himself so many times if he'd had done it to record everything and put it on the web. <laughs> <coughs> so. So I don't know how long that feeling will last or anything like that, but that's just how I feel at the moment. And so uh, my, my aim is to go and spend some time in seclusion, uh, spend some time with my father. And uh, after that, I really don't have any plans. Uh, I, I certainly, um, and as I've it's, it's said to many people, I don't, have, I don't have plans to go away. I actually like being in Sydney and I like you know, the community here and what we're doing and so on and so forth. So as every likelihood that I'll be back in the region before too long. Uh, however, I'm not making any plans. Well, one, one plan only, and that is the plan to have no plans. And that's, I think that's, to me, that's quite exciting. And I quite look forward to that, uh, that idea of having that freedom of having just nothing. No expectations, no hopes no fears, and just to see where that takes me. And uh, over, the, over the last few months, I've been uh, annoying people by uh, uh, telling them uh, stories of things that have happened to me in my life uh, where I've done that, and, uh, and it kind of works out. <coughs> Uh, one, 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 one example of those stories, and I'll just bore all those people who've heard it already, I'll bore them by telling it again, but it's a very simple story, but a few, uh, few weeks ago now we were videoing the uh, talks in Friday night, and uh, our video specialist Alex was adjusting the stand and broke it, and we needed a new stand. So we looked up on the web, where do we buy one from, how do we get there, where do we park, where do we get the money, blah, 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 how much does it cost, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, we went for uh, lunch with the with our Pali class, and we were in, in Newtown. We're walking back through the streets of Newtown. If you know, in the back streets of Newtown, it's very kind of, um, there's all these kind of very small, old sort of workers' cottages and things in those back streets, and we're sort of walking through one of those back laneways. Uh, just purely at random, because we thought, well, we just walked down a street we've never been down before, just to see what's there. So we just walked down there, and sitting on the front porch of one of these little terrace houses was a guy who was having a garage sale, and he had like you know a dozen things from his house. He was selling a bicycle and a chair and this and that, and one of them was a video camera stand, <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly what we wanted, and it was like really cheap and it was really good. And not only that, but he showed us how to adjust it so that we wouldn't break it like we broke a previous <laughs> one. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that proves that we should all live the rest of our lives like that. <laughs> <laughs> Never plan anything. If you want to buy something, just wander down the road at random and there it will be. <laughs> Anyway, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to test that hypothesis, <laughs> see, see whether it works out. So even though, even though we can kind of laugh about it, but there is, there is actually something to that, and, and this, is actually, um, uh, this is actually one of the very first lessons in Eastern spirituality which I ever learnt, long before I encountered Buddhism, my first encounter with, uh, with the, the, the profundities of Eastern philosophy was with the Tao of Pooh. Has anyone read the Tao of Pooh? We have a copy downstairs if you haven't got it. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So that's where I learned about many, many profound things that have informed my life. And one of the things that I learned about there <laughs> was that Winnie the Pooh was always happy because he never worried about things too much. Yeah? And he just he was a bear of very little brain, which means that he didn't overthink things. He just let them happen. And then somehow, because he let them sort of happen, they sort of worked out okay in the end, because he wasn't interfering with them too much. And so it's something that I've kind of 
observed over the years, and actually it is very true, and very often that we don't, you know, I mean, obviously in some cases we have to plan and all of those things. <coughs> make a seat or bring a seat up for me, please. So I do think that it's it's useful from time to time to uh, sort of wipe the slate clean and then see what will come back. Actually, since I've announced my uh, intention to retire, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who've come up to me to talk about their midlife crises. <laughs> and it's very surprising how this happens, or even late life crises. You know, people who come up and you know they're children have grown up and they've left home and what do they do now? Yeah, they've been looking forward to having such a peaceful time for so many years but now they're just sitting alone in their home and it's lonely and they're sad and depressed and they don't know what to do. Right? So there's a lot of people who, who, who feel, I mean, these are stages of life that we go through. Yeah? And uh, so I do think that it's useful from time to time to just have that courage to just let things go and then see what comes back. It's not a matter of getting rid of everything or not wanting to do anything or any of those kinds of things. It's just a matter of putting things to one side and then seeing what's of real value. Okay? Because we tend to, you know, it's like when we, it's like moving home. Yeah? If you stay in one home for too long, you sort of tend to accumulate all this junk. And then when you move home, it's a good opportunity to uh, leave all the rubbish behind and just take the things that really matter. Uh, so that's a process that I'll be going through in the next few days. So uh, my friend, my good friend Charles Barton just moved house and you know all these boxes and stuff and all of these things and I'm thinking to myself well I've got to move home from here and I've been here for 10 years. I have to make sure to leave at least a couple of hours to do my packing. <laughs> Not that I'll take that long to pack, but to take that long to, to, to get rid of the things that I'm not going to pack will take a couple of hours. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, then since I, I mentioned it a couple of months ago and let people know that this is what I was planning to do, uh, I've been very uh, heartened and very um, been very uh, beautiful and very, I felt very supported, uh, very loved by the community, and I felt that that uh, there's been a great deal of understanding of what I've been doing. Not necessarily understanding in the sense of you know knowing exactly why I'm doing it, because I certainly don't understand it in that sense. But understanding in the sense that well, people re people respect the decision uh, that I'm doing, uh, and. I've also been very heartened uh, and been encouraged by the response of the, uh, the Sangha, uh, the Bhikkhunis, uh, especially our Sudama and our Padachara who've been here through, through here through the whole time and planning to stay for the rains and now joined by Aidamananda, also Aya Pasada and Aya Manisara who've been helping us through the process. And uh, it's and the committee, of course, uh, and all the people who've been helping to organise things. It's very, uh, it's essential for the maturing of the bhikkhuni community uh, and the Buddhist community in their relation to the bhikkhuni community that the bhikkhunis be able to uh, live, to learn, to thrive and manage and uh, run the community <coughs> by and for themselves. This is how it was in the early days of the Buddha and that's how it should be today. And uh, I, uh, I think it's, you know, I, I understand fully that, that it's not an easy thing to do. There's uh, a lot of new skills that need to be learned and uh, a lot of challenges and so on. Those things are all 
good. We shouldn't be afraid of the, the hard work or the responsibility or the challenges. Uh, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not someone who's ever let my um, choices be determined by fear. Yeah? And a lot of times people say, well, that would be a lot of hard work or that would be hard for them to do or something. I've never let that stop me. If something's hard to do, you just do it anyway. And if you learn how to do hard things, so what? It's just life. You do some hard things in life. Big deal. So the fact that it's hard shouldn't be an issue. The, the only issue is, is it something that's really worthwhile? Is it something that we really want to do? And if it's something that you really want to do, it doesn't matter how hard it is. You just do it anyway. And so for the Bikunis in this period coming up, and they've been very wonderful in stepping up and um, contributing and working together and trying to help establish uh, a place here. Uh, and when I say uh, Bikunis, of course I mean all the nuns, I'm not meaning to exclude Ayapatachara, uh, who's uh, still a seminary, and he'll be taking Bikuni ordination before too long. But for all the nuns who've been here and are looking after the place. So I want to ask you as a Buddhist community to uh, continue with that and to give your support for the nuns. Uh, to you know, and to recognize each person to recognize for yourselves <coughs> this is this is crucial for the development of Buddhism. Make no mistake, the days of patriarchal religions are over. Full stop. Uh, there are desperate, embattled fundamentalist patriarchies all around the world, from the Vatican to the um, Islam to the Anglican Church to the Buddhist various various Buddhist churches and Hinduism and so on, and they're all fighting these very sad rearguard actions to try to hold on to their discriminations and privileges and power and all of those silly things. <coughs> and those those rearguard actions are doomed to fail for one simple reason, and that simple reason is because they are completely against all of the principles of love and compassion and understanding which all of these religions are based on. And so they are doomed to fail. So make no mistake, that will happen. And we have the opportunity to build something beautiful. Our choice is not uh, between do we have a, a sangha of bhikkhus only and do we have a sangha with bhikkhus and bhikkhunis only? Our choice is do we have a sangha or not? If we don't develop a bhikkhuni community, then uh, the only form of Buddhism which will survive in the future will be uh, a secularized, um, basically new age um, lay Buddhism. And hey, maybe that's what should survive. I don't know. But if we believe in the Sangha, and if we believe that there is a place in the world for those who really want to practice in the way that the Buddha laid down in every respect, starting from the sila, the ethics, the practice, everything, then we need to support the establishment and the thriving of the bhikkhuni community. So this will take time, and we can't, um, we can't expect too much, we can't expect quick results. You know, we're looking at not, we're not looking at, at 10 years down the road, we're looking at 30 or 50 or 100 years down the road for a, a really well-established and thriving bhikkhuni community. It takes that kind of that depth of teaching and you know, uh, all of those things, of grounding and that breadth in, in the practice. So for the moment, the bhikkhuni community, we're in, we're in you know, constant uh, dialogue about these things. How do we uh, interpret certain linear rules? How do we live certain kinds of things? And uh, you know, we've been in discussions with the Bikunis here constantly for years about these things, and and none of them are uh, fully resolved. They are things which the Bikuni communities will <coughs> gradually work out and evolve over the next uh, several decades. Even though Santi itself is a small, you know, small-sized community. Um, you know, we're about, you know, you can see we have had a very large impact. Uh, we have at the moment six bikunis and one seminary here today. So the ones who are living here, and uh, Asadira and uh, Ayesha who are visiting. This is very rare in the world. Have six bikunis in one room, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so I made the 
invitation on Friday night when we had five, now we've got six. So if anybody wants to have a quick uh, ordination, <laughs> now's your chance. <laughs> So this is really something special, uh, and something which needs to be protected and nurtured with understanding and with compassion. As we've done our little bit here at Santi to support this, uh, of course there are many other people all around the world who are doing this, and often on a much kind of larger scale. Obviously the <coughs> biggest movement towards establishing the bhikkhunis within Theravada has been in Sri Lanka, where we now have Certainly hundreds, perhaps a thousand bikunis now in Sri Lanka. Mm. Yeah, I had to come back from there fairly recently. Mm. About a thousand maybe. So that's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and even in Thailand now, I, it's hard to get figures, but maybe 50 or 100 bikunis in Thailand, mm. I would think. Maybe. Is that Theravada bikunis, yeah. yeah. Uh, in Cambodia also. In, um, <coughs> America, Germany, Indonesia, uh, KL. Yeah. Uh, some of you may remember Sister Upeka, who stayed here for a couple of years. Uh, she's been instrumental in helping to establish the Gautami Vihara in KL, and so on and so forth. So these things are happening uh, everywhere around the world. So one of the good things is that the community here has a lot of very strong connections uh, with those bikuni communities, and I've encouraged them and I, on behalf of the Sangha, but also it's something to think about on behalf of the, the lay community, is also to, to get in touch with and um, be a part of the community of bikunis internationally. Uh, especially, we have especially close connections with the bikunis, obviously in Damasara in Perth, and also with uh, Aranyabodi in uh, the US and other places as well, but they're probably the two main <coughs> ones. And so to, to take an interest in these things, get to know people, listen to the teachings, uh, you know, introduce yourselves on Facebook to people, and get, you, you can get to know those communities and bring people in so that we're, we're part of that network. If the, if the community here is kind of isolated and just a few people, then it can feel sometimes like it's too hard. But if it's part of a much bigger network, then um, uh, that's, I think, the only way that it can really be possible. So that's something that are uh, something to think about for everyone here, uh, and I know that you know some of the bikunis are contactable through Facebook and so on and so forth. So it would be terrific to uh, uh, get in touch with them, just introduce yourselves, and uh, say you're a supporter of Santi, and um, just get to know people. <laughs>